You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcasts from the past decade with a teensy bit of humor, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. Up first on the docket, here's a story from the archives I think you will really enjoy. Let's discuss the case for No Strings Attached from ITV News. Hosted by reporter Robert Murphy, this eight-part series unpacks the story of a tragic parachute accident. Or was it? Before we skydive into all that, quick reminder, if you want to take your listening experience to the next level, go to thetruecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter where I curate visual aids to accompany the show. It's where you will also find the links to my weekly top three podcast power ranking. And now, a few words about No Strings Attached. The case is an A++, but the storytelling is a B- for me. Again, this comes from ITV News based out of the UK, and it feels very British and proper, even when they're interviewing the owner of a swingers club. Yeah, we'll get there. The series won't be for everyone, but I was lulled into the charming Britishness of it all. Very formal, with an abundance of flowery words. One of the investigators will say something like, Well, now, he was employed at a gymnasium operating as a physical exercise training instructor. Versus, yeah, he's a trainer at a gym. Let's just say the series takes the scenic route to get to the point. And again, I was just so blown away by this case, but I really wish the story had been told in a different way. So that's what I'm going to do now. A true crime story makeover. And bonus, it's a British true crime story. So today, we're going to solve the case of why a country invaded half of the world in search of spice and then refuses to use any of it in their cooking. (laughs) Ha ha, JK, JK. We're actually here to solve the case of Victoria Sillier. First, we have to fly to England, to Wiltshire County, home of the Netherhaven Airfield. It's April 5th, 2015, Easter Sunday, and 40-year-old Victoria Sillier is here on a mission to jump out of a plane. Victoria is an expert skydiver, freefall instructor, and overall adrenaline junkie with over 2,500 completed jumps. I guess Brits gotta do something to spice up their life because their food is so bland! But Victoria hasn't been able to jump in over 10 months. Not since she found out she was expecting her second child. She had recently given birth to her son and was experiencing postpartum depression. This jump was going to help her find clarity. Should she hang it up, put her skydiving career on pause and instead focus on being a mother? Or should she find a way to continue in this sport that she loved so dearly? Victoria would soon get her answer. She was in a group with 11 other people. The weather wasn't great out, so they're going to have to stay under the cloud cover at a lower altitude, around 4,000 feet, and do what skydivers refer to as a hop and pop, where they jump and almost immediately open their parachutes. The 11 other skydivers, they jump first, and then it's Victoria's turn. I can only imagine the excitement and mixed emotions she must have felt as she leapt from the plane. But any feelings of joy would quickly turn to panic as Victoria tries to deploy her main parachute but realizes it has failed. She may be a little rusty, but Victoria has dealt with many tricky situations during her career, so she immediately knows to deploy her reserve parachute. But that one has failed too. Her lines were all twisted. She did her best to quickly untangle them so her chute would inflate, but she was out of time. Victoria Sillier free falls from the sky and hits the ground. Victoria had grown up near Edinburgh, Scotland, and at the age of 16, her mother is diagnosed with cancer. So Victoria did her first jump for a charity event. 
Tragically, she loses her mother to cancer when she was just 17 years old. But Victoria was strong, and she found purpose in her life. She continued pursuing her passion of skydiving, and at the age of 22, she joined the Royal Army Medical Corps and worked as a physiotherapist. She rises up the ranks to captain and marries and then divorces her first husband. But then she meets her second husband, Emil, at the infirmary after he injured himself on an army-related off-duty ski trip. They have a whirlwind romance, quickly discovering they had so much in common. Both were enlisted, both had previous marriages that didn't work out, and both were total adrenaline junkies. After dating for a year, Emil proposes to Victoria, and three months later, they get married. She soon gives birth to her daughter, Emil and Victoria buy their big, gorgeous dream house, and Victoria had just given birth to a beautiful baby son. She had everything, but it all came crashing down. Onlookers watched in horror as Victoria fell over 4,000 feet at a speed of 60 miles per hour before she hit the ground. The first people to reach her brought a body bag because there was absolutely no way anyone could have survived such a fall. But Victoria did survive. I know, dude, right? That phrase against all odds gets thrown around so willy-nilly, but Victoria surviving skydiving without a parachute is quintessentially against all odds. It was a mashup of these random factors and you put it all together to create this perfect survival scenario. So let's break it down. First, she had landed in a newly plowed field, so the ground was much softer when she landed. The weather was also not great that Easter Sunday, which again meant that she had to jump from a much lower altitude than a typical skydiving jump. And on top of everything else, she had a small frame, which meant a lesser impact. Victoria Cillier had escaped death, but she had a collapsed lung, a broken spine, shattered pelvis, several broken ribs, and a long road of recovery ahead of her. But she was lucky to be alive after enduring such a weird freak accident. Or was it? Everyone on site is gobsmacked, ecstatic that Victoria is still alive. But one man surveys the scene with a sinking suspicion that this was no accident. Mark Beata was the head skydiving instructor of the entire Army Parachute Association. While everyone else was looking at Victoria, Beata was looking at her main parachute, which was suspiciously knotted and tangled on one side. When Victoria was lifted onto the stretcher, he noticed her reserve parachute had fallen underneath her, had two key safety components unattached. This was no mechanical failure. The parachutes had clearly been tampered with. This was attempted murder. Mark calls the police. Ah, yeah, we have ourselves a classic whodunit. And it's a proper British one at that, Charles. But because she survived and this isn't actually a murder investigation, the authorities don't make the case a priority. They assign just three overworked detectives who already have full caseloads. So they're going to need our help investigating you guys. Where should we start? I know you're not a bunch of punk rookies who are new to the force. You're true crime vets. So let's say it together on the count of three. The first person they should look into. Ready? One, two, three, the husband! Haha, <laughs> <laughs> Jinx, you owe me a pint at the pub after we knock off work. In the meantime, let's learn a little more about Victoria's husband, Emile Cellier. He was born and raised in South Africa, and when he was 16, he starts dating a 13-year-old Nicolene Shepard. Three years later, she's pregnant and gives birth to their first child. A year after that, they have a second child. They get engaged, and Emile acquires a work visa and moves to the UK to establish a career and build a better life for Nicolene and his two children. 
But instead, he's faffing around, working at bars, and meeting lots of ladies. In fact, he meets another lady named Carly at the pub. They have a whirlwind romance, get married, and have two children together. And you don't have to be beloved Agatha Christie fictional detective Hercule Poirot to start noticing a pattern here, chaps. Nicoline is patiently waiting to hear from Emile so she can relocate with her children to the UK. Instead, she finds out that Emile married another woman from Emile's mom. Nicoline confronts Emile, who insisted it was just all to establish citizenship. He tries to rekindle things with Nicoline, claiming that Carly was just an ex, but the two women connect and confront him together. That was the end of that. Then Emil meets Victoria and again repeats the pattern of having two kids and getting bored. He is also dating a gal he met through Tinder named Stephanie Guller and also hooking up with call girls and going to swingers clubs. My favorite part of the whole No Strings Attached series is episode four titled Lifting the Mask where this proper sounding English broadcaster is retracing the steps of the investigation, which leads him to a swingers club, a swingers club named after an equine's genitalia. Ugh, don't make me say it. It rhymes with bonky bix. Any this journalist is interviewing the proprietor of bonky bix. And this guy is surprisingly just the most wholesome, charming fella. He offers his guests non-alcoholic refreshments, clean pressed linens, and a customary English breakfast. It sounds more like he's the host of a traditional bed and breakfast, plus lots of forking. All for incredibly affordable rates. Yeah, so Emil was a regular at Bonky Bix before he's kicked out for improper behavior. He's also exhibiting more improper behavior leading up to the day Victoria falls to her near death including messaging Mr. Stephanie saying, quote, to be with you, I would do anything, end quote, and also denying to Stephanie the paternity of his second child to Victoria. He also tells her that he will be able to enjoy spontaneous dates again after April. As you will recall, this was the month of Victoria's accident. On top of that, he's texting a sex worker hours after his wife's accident looking for a hookup and asking if he can film it. Yeah, I'd like to mash his bangers too. But being a skeezy cheating womanizer does not a murderer make. However, we do find evidence that Emil tried to off his wife before her accident. About a week prior, Victoria woke up in the morning to the strong smell of gas. She was home alone with her two young children. Emil had been sleeping at the army base that night, but we will later find out that he was hooking up with his ex-wife, Carly. We will also discover that there was fresh blood on the tampered gas valve and on a pair of pliers that matched Emil's, who also happened to be sporting a fresh cut on his hand. The bewildered Victoria immediately contacted the gas engineer to fix the problem. Then she messaged husband Emil. He brushed it off like no big deal. And she jokingly asks, are you trying to kill me? Also weird little tidbit. It was later discovered that in his internet search history, Emil also Googled wet nurse services a few days prior to Victoria's skydiving accident. A wet nurse is someone who steps in to breastfeed a child if or when the mother is not able to. It's bizarre to me that Emil is cool with potentially killing his children in a gas explosion, but also wants to make sure that his infant son that he's denying paternity of stays fed. I'm not always sure Emil is thinking with his head. More like he's thinking with his Wiltshire head cheese, am I right? Regardless, it sure does look like he's our guy. All signs point to Emil. But why? He didn't kill his first two baby mamas, so why cut the cord on Victoria? Hmm. It looks like we've got ourselves a classic why done it, folks. After going through hundreds more of his messages, it looks like Emil is very unhappy in his marriage, and he's also really hung up on his side chick, Stephanie Goller. 
She was becoming more than just a tender fling. Emil was messaging this beautiful Austrian woman who also loved skiing and skydiving up to 750 times a day. He was also sharing with her property listings of potential houses they could share together. Also, remember when I mentioned that Victoria and Emil had just purchased their dream house? Well, they were also living in a nightmare of debt. Compound that with the additional debt Emil accrued behind Victoria's back. It was costing him a lot of money to fund his cheeky lifestyle, wooing the ladies, going on trips abroad, and paying for sex workers. He would borrow money from friends and also payday loan companies. He was personally in the hole at 22,000 euros or around 30 grand USD, and these loan companies were at his door looking to collect. He also had a life insurance policy on Victoria that would pay out over 200,000 USD if she died from an accidental death. Blimey! That sounds like a clear motive to me, blokes. It's pretty easy to see his fingerprints all over the gas leak quote accident, but proving tampering with a parachute is going to be tricky to prove. There have been several safety protocols put in place to prevent tampering after the case of Stephen Hilder. So quick detour, in 2003, Stephen Hilder was a 20-year-old cadet officer also based in Wiltshire, England. He was an experienced skydiver who had completed over 200 jumps, but he tragically perished when both his main parachute and reserve chute failed. Hinder fell over 13,000 feet to his death. It was later discovered that key safety components to his chute had been deliberately cut. A few fellow skydivers were arrested but released without charge, and investigators later concluded that Hilder must have cut his own straps, even though there were no signs that he was suicidal. And witnesses claimed they saw him desperately trying to deploy both his main chute and his reserve chute not the behavior of someone trying to kill themselves. So yeah, I'm not convinced the Stephen Hilder case has ever truly been solved. However, after this incident, the British Parachute Association issued strict measures that reserve chutes must be packed and checked by a certified professional and stored under lock and key on the airbase. Since putting these protocols in place, the UK has documented over 2,300,000 successful jumps, and there hasn't been a documented case of both a main parachute and reserve chute both failing. That was until Victoria Sillier. So how, with all of this in place, would Emile have the means to tamper with Victoria's parachute? Ooh, it looks like we have ourselves a classic how done it. So a little more deep background on Emile. Back in 2011, when he was saving up for his wedding to Victoria, she got him a job to earn extra cash packing parachutes. Noted, we have an expert packer on our hands. Victoria will later recall that Emil had grown distant over the past few months. She had figured it was the stress over having a new baby, but Victoria was feeling depressed and desperately wanted to get the spark back in her marriage. So she was thrilled when Emil suggested they do a tandem skydive together. They had originally planned to jump the day before Victoria's accident on Saturday the 4th of April. They go to the base, rented out the reserve parachutes, and waited for the skies to clear. The skies never did. Emil suggests that Victoria go on her own the next day because he had to quote, work. She's a little bummed but agrees to the plan. Before calling it a day and leaving the base, Emil takes his daughter to the bathroom, wearing the reserve shoot pack on his back. Pretty awkward, cumbersome load to take into the bathroom with you, Emil. Witnesses later recalled that he was in the bathroom for a good five to 10 minutes or so. One person even recalled hearing the daughter shouting, I'm all done, daddy. But Emil remained in the bathroom. So, Either Emil was taking a huge dookie, or he was tampering with his wife's parachute. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm smelling sabotage. Emil loads the shoot pack into Victoria's personal locker instead of returning it to the secured reserve chute station. 
Victoria jumps the next day and her parachutes fail. It's all come together for us now. We know the who, why, and how. But Victoria, she can't accept it. Investigators reveal all of Emile's affairs and debts, but she doesn't want to believe that he would ever hurt her. But with or without Victoria's help, investigators are able to make their case. After nine months of sifting through Emile's WhatsApp and text messages, they have a case ready for trial. Victoria takes the witness stand and she goes back and forth. She recounts her harrowing fall from the sky, but then later claims that she had been exaggerating on how long Emile was in the bathroom with her parachute pack. Then she also even claims that she was the one who messed with the gas lines. But eventually Emile is found guilty, sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 18 years. At the sentencing hearing, the presiding judge says of Victoria that she seemed to quote, have recovered from the physical harm, but not having seen her in the witness box at length from the psychological harm. Immediately after Emile's conviction, Victoria told the press that she did not accept the guilty verdict. But since his conviction, the fog has lifted for Victoria and she has clarity on Emile. After years of this crazy mind control coercion, Victoria finally has come to terms, saying, quote, it took a lot for me to finally recognize that he must have done it. How could someone I married, loved, and had children with have done something that despicable? The incarcerated Emil continues denying that he played any part in attempting to murder Victoria, and he also spent years denying Victoria a divorce. As of 2020, Victoria was still dealing with a messy divorce battle, but I do have some good news. She is currently in a healthy relationship with a longtime friend, a fellow skydiver she had met at the airbase over nine years ago. Victoria said she didn't have to explain anything to him. He knows and understands everything. He was her rock during the COVID lockdowns and is active with her kids, playing rugby, cricket, and whatever else the Brits enjoy for amusing pastimes. And Victoria also returned to the sky, jumping once again, her kids cheering her on as she floated safely to the ground. Ah, looks like we got ourselves a classic happy ending. Case closed. Cheerio, old chaps. Yes, I love it. If you want more Dirty Deeds, check out the No Strings Attached podcast series, also, Victoria Sillier wrote a book titled I Survived with the tagline, I married a charming man, then he tried to kill me. Yikes, what a crazy story. Even though it's about a skydive gone wrong, I actually appreciated learning about all the safety measures and it made me less scared to maybe try it someday. I'm still on the fence. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Spill all the English tea with me about this case. You can email me directly at Angela at the true or join the true crime feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and be kind to fellow true crime feed friends. Stay tuned until after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show. Like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent, one woman show, and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now, back to the show. And we are back. Here are the three shows currently trending that I think are worth a listen. I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. At the number three spot, we have Believable the Coco Bertheman story. Here's a synopsis. Coco Bertheman became internet famous by sharing her story of surviving sex trafficking as a young girl growing up in Germany. She was sheltered and supported by families in Utah where her faith and fame intertwined. 
But in 2022, Coco was arrested for raising money for a fake cancer diagnosis, and people began to doubt everything she had ever said. Is her life story truly one big elaborate lie? All righty, Coco is back on the ranking. After a few episodes of Detours, we are back on track, finding out exactly what Coco has been lying about. The investigation team goes back to Germany and makes contact with key figures from Coco's life, who let's say have some different recollections. It can be so easy to dismiss someone's entire story as bunk once you've caught them in a few lies. So I appreciate the journalists investigating each claim individually, and they have actually discovered some nuggets of truth. But man, they are really putting in the work, and I am captivated by this descent into the particulars with Believable the Coco Bertheman story. At the number two spot, we have a rare tie, folks. I couldn't choose a single number two. I am loving these both so much. So at number two A, we have Over My Dead Body Season 4 Gone Hunting. Here's a rundown. When Mike Williams vanishes on a hunting trip, the authorities presume he was eaten by alligators. But one woman begins to suspect the true predators may lurk much closer to home. It sets her on a tireless crusade to uncover what really happened to Mike. A story about an obsessive love affair, a scandalous secret, and a mother's battle for justice. Dang, we are getting into the thick of it now. Mike's widow is having a hard time moving on with her life after her husband's disappearance, and we hear why that might be. I'm loving the way the story is unfolding. You're getting these juicy little tidbits of information that are being revealed very selectively, a little at a time. It makes this such an addictive listen. So don't miss Over My Dead Body Gone Hunting. And at number two, part B, we have Smokescreen Betrayal on the Bayou. Here's a synopsis. For almost two decades, DEA Special Agent Chad Scott ruled the streets just north of New Orleans. He controlled a network of snitches by convincing people he arrested to work for him as informants. Chad would stop at nothing to put drug dealers behind bars. His successes won awards at the DEA, but his willingness to bend the rules earned him a terrifying reputation on the streets. Some called him the Golden Boy. Others called him the White Devil. Investigators go over his career with a fine-tooth comb, asking the question, is Chad Scott the greatest DEA agent in the South, or is he a criminal? Oh my gosh, this latest episode got me really worked up. I was in my own little world listening, and I bumped into a friend, and he was like, Angela, are you okay? What's wrong? And I'm like, the DEA, man, that's what's wrong. You guys, I can't believe what the DEA is legally allowed to do with the informant program, and just what an impossible no-one position some of these informants are in. It's really messed up, but I am glad to have this information. So get on the messy, grumpy train with me and tune in to Smokescreen Betrayal on the Bayou. And at the number one spot, we have The Girlfriends. Here's a reminder from the show page. It's 1995 and Carol Fisher is a high-flying divorcee looking for love in Las Vegas. It's slim pickings in the medical community she works in, but then Bob comes to town. Bob Bierenbaum is a plastic surgeon who flies planes and speaks several languages. Her mom loves that he's Jewish, but there's something off about him. He's perfect on paper, but he's quick to anger, and he never talks about his ex-wife, who it turns out is missing and presumed dead. In this riveting nine-part series, Carol Fisher uncovers the truth of Gail Katz's death, the systems that failed her, and all of the girlfriends that brought her to justice. They just dropped the final episode of the nine-part series, And episode 9 isn't the most enjoyable of the whole series, but it is a proper closing for an incredible story with some of the best theme music to match. We hear a parole board, I'll use the term confession loosely from Bob. I do think there are some truthful parts to his statement, but there's a lot of faff in there too. We also get to hear Gail's sister Elaine connect with the girlfriends finally. The show also pays tribute to the many, many, many other missing women whose cases remain unsolved. 
This has been one of my favorite series, and I'm really, really going to miss my time with the girlfriends. Now for my miss of the week. We have Cold Case Files. Here's a synopsis from the show page. Based on the iconic Emmy-nominated series on A&E, this show explores some of the most difficult-to-solve murders, which stymied investigators and went cold, sometimes for decades. In fact, one-third of all murders in America remain open. But thanks to dogged investigators and breakthroughs in forensic technology, these cases become part of the rare 1% of cold cases that are ever solved. This show used to be pretty good. I enjoyed a lot of the older episodes when it was hosted by Bill Curtis. I've just been so sidetracked by other shows. I haven't been tuning in in a while. And I was going through my podcast feed looking to do some fall cleaning. I decided to check this one out again, but man, it isn't even the same show. The new host is giving me nooch, but I hardly even get to hear her talk because there are almost a comical level of ads. I don't usually like to judge a show by their ads or how many they do because ads are important. They are why podcasts can be free for all and how creators make money. So I respect the game. You know, even the girlfriends has a lot of ads, but the content was so good that I didn't mind at all. I'm actually super thrilled for them. And I hope the girlfriends all get together and ball out on some lavish fettuccine suppers because they earned it. But cold case files, dude, I swear it's more like ads than a podcast. It's become unlistenable, and I am recondoing this one out of my feed, sending it down my podcast queue trapdoor. Find out next week who will be in the number one spot now that The Girlfriends has concluded. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what show fell through your podcast queue trapdoor. I'll meet you here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next feeding fix. That's all for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation, especially Instagram where I am making some dank memes for every episode. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave a review. Tell your fellow partners in crime to listen to True Crime Feed. Thanks for riding along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.